Well, hello everybody and welcome to Frankston City Libraries. Today we are talking to TM Clark. Before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians on the land in which Frankston City Libraries operate, the Bunurong people of the Kulin Nations, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like, like to extend those respects to any elders of any other communities who may be joining us today. I will hand over to Tina. Thank you so much, Tina. Thank you for having me and, and welcome everyone. All right, so who am I? Now I'm just gonna try and share my screen. There we Beautiful. go. All right, so what to expect today. So we're, I'm just gonna talk about me and my writing journey and covering just the different themes of the flamingos, obviously because um, this was a promotion for my um, Cry of the Fire Bird book. Um, I'm gonna talk about Canvas Dam, a little bit about the sand, about old timers. Um, and conspiracy theories and then I'm just going to share some of my holiday snaps with you which I took in January when I had an unexpected trip to South Africa so and there we go all right so I was born in Zimbabwe um for those who, who, who don't know me so um I was born in a little town called uh, well, called Bulawayo which is the second biggest town but I'd actually lived to the north um, to the north of that, which in, in, in a place called Nyama and Jlovo, which means meat of the elephants, because it used to be part of the hunting ground of King um, Logan Gula. So I, I sort of, um, so that's where I grew up. So um, you can see from these pictures, I was very rural, obviously, it, you know, I, I grew up on, on a farm and yes, that's real, a real gun and it's, um, it was a war zone. I, I grew up in the seventies during the, during the Bush war. So um, I also had a father who um, was very much, you know, an army person and um, would go away and fight and come back. And his expertise were terrorist weapons. So at a very young age, I got a very healthy respect for different weapons. And I was probably about eight, nine when he taught us to throw hand grenades and, um, you know, and actually do a lot of um, the work around like plastics explosives and things so that when he was off at war and like the guys would need like a tree moved when they were making a new lands um for us to plow and stuff um i could then wrap a tree with um with cortex put in a detonator and blow it up for them so even though i was very young i was i was always i, I think i was just very lucky that i was trusted with them you know and we and we just we were just really lucky that that was the type of thing. And I thought that that was normal, that everybody grew up like that. And that it was, you know, that it was just normal for everybody to have that type of childhood. I didn't realize that my childhood was anything special or anything, anything um, um, going the wrong way now. There we go. Um, so then when I moved to South Africa after my father died when I was 12, I moved to this little town called Coxdad, which is um, about three hours inland of Durban. And um, it was just like us five girls. So my mom and us, and we moved into a boarding school and we had nothing. So we had gone from all the freedom of this huge, you know, this huge farm with 25 horses and all these cattle and everything and, and all this wild game to a farming community and just living in a, a boarding hostel. But what made it worse is that we didn't actually speak Afrikaans. So my mom's job was as an Afrikaans um, matron in the hostel and she was in the Afrikaans hostel and they pushed us into the English hostel. So during the term time, we were actually segregated. So every night we would stand at the window looking down at her hostel from our hostel on the hill and we could wave to her to say good night. And then we would go back to our own dormitories and, and sleep in the English hostel. So South Africa was a huge learning curve for me because not only had, was I suddenly split into black and white, where I hadn't been split into black and white in, South, in, in Zimbabwe, it was like the split as well between all the different languages. And um, so I, sorry, let's get that out. I forgot to unplug the phone. <laughs> there we go. Um, so, so it was this, this learning curve ab ab about um, being segregated. Now, one of the things that people don't think about with South Africa is that where I was, it was against the Drakensberg Mountains. It's like in the foot of the Drakensberg. And um, we actually used to have snow and, and it was really, really cold. And I, I hate snow. It was like freezing. Um, this is actually our school, um, our school fields in the front of our school where I have um actually you you can see all the snow on the fields where we used to play and that's at like break time during school and it's um 
while it was very pretty and everything else, and I learned to live with it, I, I chose not to live in the cold. I chose to live here instead, which is you know, beautiful Bribe Island. And I you know, kind of swapped the cold for the lovely tropical climate of, of Bribe. And um, this is one of our photographs of when we take our boat out, actually looking um, at the whales when we go. That's Morton Island in the background. And I really... I really sort of, and I'm, I'm not sad that I have swapped the, you know, the, the African wildlife for the Australian wildlife, because I, I think that for me, my boys have got a, an amazing life here. They would have had an amazing life in South Africa, they just have a different one here. But my heart is now sort of like cut in three. I sort of like have a part of me in Africa, a big part of me is in Australia, obviously, and a big part of me is now in Papua New Guinea. So it's, um, it's, it's sort of like split across the three, the three very, very distinct places now. So why did I become a writer? Um, totally by fluke, I would say, because I'm actually very dyslexic. Um, I only started reading when I was about 14 or 15, and I started reading Mills and Boons. When I found my first Mills and Boon on a shelf and I could read it, and it didn't matter if I skipped a word, I could still understand what was going on. I suddenly started reading. And obviously, the more I read, the better I got, and the faster I got, and I caught up really, really, really fast. I was always bright, so it wasn't a problem of being able to cover it up at school. Um, also, I was in boarding school. So having 12 years of boarding school actually was probably the, one of the easiest ways to cover up something like you dyslexic because I was really good at maths. So I would do my maths and then I would take my best friend's maths and do hers. And maths is really easy if you are dyslexic because you can check if you've done a six and a nine because you, you redo the sums and you can find your mistake where English is not so easy. So she would do my English homework and I would do her maths homework. And we would just swap books all the time. So it was very, very easy for me to actually cover that up. Um, and of course, because I wasn't good at English, but I was okay at the other, you know, at the other subjects, what helped me probably the most was that I was good at sports and I'm um, like really, really good at sports. So um, I was forgiven for a lot of my um, bad English in, in, in school because I needed to stay in those first teams. You know, when I was in grade seven, I was really in a first team, you know, that, that was playing with like the year 12s. So um so to keep me there, you know, like they would just sort of like be really good. So I did work at school, but it was um, nothing actually pointed at me being an author when I was at school. But I've always been a storyteller. Um, I've always told stories. We have stories from when I was like, when we were kids, um, I, used, I made up this, this man called Mr. Sakatam that my youngest sister, she's younger than me, um, she used to suck her thumb. And I made up this whole story that he was going to come and he was going to cut her thumb off because she wouldn't stop sucking her thumb. And so I've always been this, so, you know, the thriller writer was already there. Um, but I've always been the storyteller. And, you know, so it, I suppose it was, a, it was a progression of sorts. And I've always had really, really deep roots in Africa. So I'm just going to share with you, this is one of my, um, my cousins. This is Amalinda. Um, this is actually Kulu Lodge where this takes place. Um, this is my background in, in, in Zimbabwe. They still have a lodge and they've just spent an amazing time in isolation with these elephants and with all the game there. So uh, it has got sound. I'm hoping that the sound will work. Okay, and then push that. Hopefully it's not going to be too loud. Okay, so you can sort of see that's my that's sort of my background and, and that's sort of how I grew up like we, we would have elephants actually walk through our farm every now and again when I you know when I was growing up um, that's actually outside Hawangi National Park so I've been really really lucky that I've, I've kept this affinity with with animals and and and, um, and with you know with the wildness of, of our lives this is um, pictures of um, some lion cubs which my cousin actually brought up now we brought up 
um, cheetah cubs when I was growing up um, until they got like to a certain age and then, then they had to go. But you know, it was the time of black and white photographs and we didn't have lots of photographs. We don't even have a photograph of them, which I was quite, quite surprised about. But so these two beautiful cubs, this is Nduna and Nzengeli. And this is 1997, we went back to Zimbabwe and this is my, my eldest son now who's 23. You can see he was just a baby then. And um, they were actually brought up in, in the safari lodge. And then when they got too old, um, they actually had to be let out and they went into a concession. Um, so my first book was actually inspired by, by these um, beautiful little cubs. They were, they were so stunning. And my, my cousin, her little girl was Savannah and she was a little bit older than my son, probably about two years. And she would, um, she would stand like we would have a, a, baby, a baby monitor with us and then she would be in her room and the lions would jump over the stable door and get into the house. And then you would just hear Savannah call, lion, lion, lion. And everybody would run to the house to, because the lions had got into her room and then she would be on top of the double bunk where she knew to get up high so that they, because they got so big that they had started, you know, they, they were getting a little bit too boisterous and things. So, um, but they were beautiful. And, and so it, it's sort of like, once I had done um, that story, I did sort of more stories just started coming and I, I sort of like, and I really just, I needed to carry on telling stories. So 1998, 1999, I began writing fiction. And it wasn't until 2005 that I had my first book actually published. And this was part of a Traker series, which was an educational series for Macmillan. And um, as you can see, I wrote as Tina Marie Clark then, um, because there was a Tina Clark who was writing really, really religious stuff. And I went, oh, you know, I can't be, um, you know, mistaken for, 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 for this person. And, and strange enough, I actually did get mistaken for her. And I, I went to a school and they had all this religious poetry and I had to say, this is beautiful poetry, but this is not mine. I'm um, Tina Marie Clark, you know, so, so it does happen with authors when you have very similar names. Um, it took me about six years to get that published and I couldn't understand why it was so hard. Now at the time, obviously, you know, 2005, the internet wasn't what it was today. I used to take books out from the library um, on Bribe Island and, you know, Bribe Island's God's waiting ground. So often the book would go out and the person, you know, would cross over the rainbow bridge and then we would have to wait for their houses to be cleared out and stuff. And then eventually we would get the book. So, so our library system wasn't really geared at that stage to, to give us you know, books that we really always wanted. Um, books particularly on writing. And authors seemed at that stage to be holding everything close. They would come out and they would tell you how wonderful they were and how beautiful they were. But they wouldn't actually tell us anybody who helped them along the way. They seemed to sort of like hold that information really, really close. And it was, it was something that I had noticed that was happening again and again. I used to take my two little boys with me to every single author talk I could go to. And it was just, you know, that they, they, would, they would talk and they would tell us about the book and they would tell us, you know, but they, there wasn't lots of talking about the actual craft of writing. Now, one of the things that people, where people were talking about that, um, let me actually just stay on this one first. Um, one of the things that the, the, the societies that were talking about that at the time was the Romance Writers of Australia. And I went there and I learned my craft. So the Romance Writers of Australia, although they are romance writers, the craft that they teach is amazing. Um, I've been lucky enough to be involved with them since 2003, and it's just been incredible. The, the actual, the craft that they teach. Yes, that they do teach a lot of romance as well, um, but it gives you a really, really good craft to move forward in, in your writing. And, you know, who doesn't love romance? I love romance. I still love my Mills and Boons. Most, most, a lot of my author friends are Mills and Boon writers, and I absolutely love them. And I'm a Harlequin writer, so there we go. You never know where you're, going to, where you're going to land up. So because I was having this problem and I was a children's writer at that stage, I started the CYA conference. This year we've called it the All Stars Conference. Um, and I started this with two other ladies. Um, it was Di Bates and Sharon Norris. And then by the time it actually happened, um, Di and, and, and Sharon, unfortunately, had, had got sick and they had pulled out. And when we started, I had gone, we went to Brisbane Writers' Festival, and we were part of the Brisbane Writers' Festival. 
So, so it was, it, we were like a satellite event and it, it, it grew from like, you know, 26 people in that very first year in 2006. And then our biggest numbers have been like um, 198, I think it was, um, a year ago. So, and this year we've got good numbers. We've gone online and, you know, it's, it's going fine. So um, I was very happy that a lot of people actually made the transition to online with us because, you know, we still aren't traveling and it should be in like two, you know, two weeks time. So it's, it's very lucky. Um, now I'm doing the wrong thing again. There we go. So it took me until 2013 to get my first adult book published. Now, my brother, that one probably took me about 10 years to actually write. But um, when, I, when I got it published, the, the actual publication journey went really, really fast. So I had a, a, a literally a, a pitch in a lift um, at a conference. So I was at the Romance Writers Conference and I spoke to Hayley Nash in the um, in the lift and she sort of like knew me as a conference organizer and she said oh what were you doing on the pitching floor and I told her about my brother about one and I said oh you don't have to do this you know you from Harlequin you know and I said I, you know and spoiler alert and I said I kill my hero you won't buy this book and she said oh but you've heard of Mira I said you have to have an agent to get into Mira and she said no Mira we you know in Australia just send it to me and I'll have a look well, I thought she was just being nice. And about two weeks later, we had to talk about something on a conference level. And she then said to me, you still haven't sent your book. So I then sent my book to her. So it's that whole, um, a, a lot of being just in the right place at the right time. And then um, they actually bought my book. So I landed up to be a Harlequin author anyway, even though I'm in the mirror line. So I was, you know, um, it's sort of like a lovely symbiont relationship from when I was learning how to read and now I, I sort of write for them. And, you know, I had targeted them for 10 years trying to write, Mills and Boone, trying to write romances. So, wrong thing. All right. So these are, this is me. This is my books at the moment now. So this is what I've, I've sort of like... Uh, sort of getting a good um, backlist together of, of my books and it, you know but normally about one a year although I do miss I will miss this year I do not have a book coming out this year all right so I just wanted to show you how time flies when you're an author so when I did my very first book it was already 2005 my kids were already in school but I had when I started reading in, in London to them and I was reading all these picture books they always wanted me to tell them stories so I always wanted my I wanted a picture book with you know with of my own with these beautiful pictures and eventually um, I, I got one so you can see the bottom picture 2005 when I got my very first book published and then eventually when I got my first picture book published which I was so excited about I, you know it didn't matter that I was a, a bestseller in, in, in the adult stuff I was so excited to get a book with pictures in it and um, and that was how much my kids had grown so <laughs> you know they didn't need a picture book from me anymore but they still you know they still did the photograph and the only thing I see in that photograph is Oh my gosh, my, the back of my, I've still got, you know, sort of all those years later, I've, I've got the same furniture and um, it's sort of faded from the sun now. So it's, um, yeah, there we go. <laughs> all right. So how do you achieve a backlist? This is basically one of my favorite gifts. You basically have to sit in your chair and you have to type. All right. Quick, uh, there's a June promo on those books. So Tears of the Cheetah at the moment is $2.99 and Cry of the Firebird is $3.99. It was an Amazon special, but you know, the others, they always price match. So just go have a look there. And I have to put that in, otherwise I get into trouble for not promoing my books. So, okay. Elements of truth about Cry of the Firebird, because this, this talk was actually part of a tour originally. And I just had to thank Frankston Libraries again for not cancelling on me and for actually making this into a Zoom meeting instead, because from, you know, the whole tour, so it just fell apart after COVID started. So I'm really, really grateful to Frankston and thank you for having me. So um, elements of truth on, on this book. So the idea... The idea actually came quite a few years ago when I was told the story about this beautiful couple on Bribey Island who she had got old timers and she had been taken and put in, in, the, um, in the facilities here and he was at home and he couldn't stand that they were apart and he actually did sell his Stradivaria and he kidnapped her from this place and they went out west and they lived out her, their, her life out west where she was with him and so that the authorities couldn't take her away from him anymore 
And when I heard it, it was like one of those stories that just stayed with me. So the idea was sort of like there. Then I was talk. I was at an Australian um, Romance Readers conference, and Amy Andrews and I were sitting together. She's she's a very good friend of mine, and I was commenting on all these beautiful pink books that were coming across the screen. And I went, "I'm never getting a pink book." And she went, "Well, why don't you write about something like a flamingo? Then they have to give you pink, because I'm very, very, I'm very driven. I'm very market orientated with my books. If you look at the covers, you know they all have the African animals on them. So I went, oh, flamingos, that's a good idea. So then the idea of bringing those two stories together sort of like came about. So I then had to go." Because I, I, you know, I, I, I didn't know much about flamingos. Yes, I, I lived in Africa all these years, but I had never actually even seen a flamingo because they, they weren't part of from where I was. And I had to go and do internet research and find out where the flamingos were. And then I found out that there was more than one type of flamingo. And, you know, in the research, I actually found where the flamingos were in South Africa as well. And that brought me to the place. Now, the place, South Africa, where I saw this, this amazing story happening was in Campus Dam, which is out, just outside of Kimberley. Now, most people know Kimberley for their diamonds, but Kimberley has the most beautiful Argyle diamonds, if you look at this, because, you know, they've got these beautiful pink birds just on their doorstep. So, Campus Dam came into being, uh, um, came onto my radar, and then I had to do the research. And I had the most amazing people on the ground, um, like Brian Calder, he, he, um, he did a lot of the research. I, I would ask him questions and he would just come up with the stuff, which was really, really amazing. And I'd never met him. And when I went back to South Africa in January, we had planned to meet, but then my mom landed up in hospital and it just didn't happen. So it's like, I will meet him next time that I'm there. But it's, um, it was really, really incredible to find that, that these, these animals living on the right on the edge of, of, of this town of Kimberley. So you can see how close they are. They're, those are, you know, like municipal buildings right there. And then there, there are all the flamingos in, in the dam. And one of the problems that they have, obviously, is the, the train, because the train goes right past the dam. And there is no public access to this dam. This dam um, is half on pri private property and, and a little bit on, on the municipal pro property, but most of it's actually on private. And they just, um, you know, people walk up and down the, the, the train lines and, you know, to actually get to see the birds, people will walk over the, through the train lines, over the train lines, you know, through the fence, just try and see them. And one of the problems with that is that the flamingos actually are quite... Um, they're quite sensitive birds, so then if they were nesting there, then they just abandon their nests when people disturb them. So one of the um, mining companies actually got involved and they made this beautiful man-made island in the middle of the dam so that the, the, the flamingos could actually, that's the lesser flamingos, that they could actually um, nest in the middle of the island so that there's no predators and that there's no, you know, human interference. And this this won amazing environmental awards and everything and wilderness awards and all sorts of things. And it was, you know, and it, it works quite well. It doesn't work so well when there's a drought because obviously all the water disappears and then it's, it's exposed. And it didn't work so well when there was a flood because with the municipality, um, they failed to keep up the maintenance of the, of the, of the pumps that actually you know, put the sewage water into this dam. And, and the reason that this dam does so well for the flamingos is because of the sewage water and because of all the microbes that sort of grow with it. So, um, so in a flood, unfortunately, when the water comes up, the island got totally decimated. And um, so that's sort of, I bring in the true things into the book, um, but I bring it in through, obviously, through a story as well. So um, in my book, we have a rescue you can see all the beautiful flamingos along the edge. In, in the book, we have a rescue of a flamingo during a flood. Now, what actually happened, I, I had already handed this book in, and then in January, no, February last year, they actually had a big drought, and there was 3,000 flamingo babies actually saved from this dam, and they were farmed out all over South Africa to be brought up by the different wildlife organizations, and they had to feed these babies like this, these amazing con concoctions of food to bring them around. And except for 150 of those babies, all the rest have been brought back to this dam and they've been let go again. And there's now a fight over 150 of them that one of the organizations have kept 
and um, the, the, it's ongoing as to why these babies haven't been returned. And, but that is quite amazing when you think about the number of them that actually went and the number that came back. It's, it's really, really good, especially for the lesser flamingo because the lesser flamingo is endangered. So it's, it's good that their numbers are, 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 you know, are climbing and that they were helped. Um, you can see when, when they made the dam, you know, like how much the, the, the birds actually use it. Now, the funny thing is when they started using it, they, they, didn't, they didn't actually use it properly. So they went in and they built these turrets to show the flamingos that this island could be um, um, nested on. And yeah, they actually used those turrets and, they, and they made, then they made their own. So they just needed a little encouragement to use the dam and then they were fine. So this is what their normal turrets then all look like. And then as the water rises, the flamingos actually make those turrets a little bit higher and higher. So they keep their, their eggs out of the water. Um, it's a little flamingo baby. They are so beautiful and they make the most amazing noises, which I just loved. And the research on this book was just so sweet. And those are what they look like. You know, they're kind of like, um, you know, that, um, you know, the, the ugly swan who, you know, the, the ugly duckling. So it's, you know, they, they are kind of ugly ducklings because you look at them there and you think, oh my gosh, they, they are so ugly. And then you look at them and then they're so beautiful with all their pink. So I had the flamingo part of it. So I, I knew that I could write this book with the flamingos. And then I went, okay, what else is in this area? And I started sort of researching this area. And I found that the sand of Platfontaine were actually outside of Kimberley. And I went, oh, I've never written about, you know, the sand people before. So um, I sort of like started the research and that uh, on the sand people. Now the sand people are called the sand. They used to be called the Bushmans. Um, apparently they don't like either name because they never chose either of the names. So when I say Bushman, it's not said in a, a derogatory way at all. And if you say the sand, it's not derogatory. So they're, they're, they're just known as both at the moment. So Platfontaine is actually a really, really amazing place. Um, amazing in that it has a really horrible history that goes behind it. Um, so if you're very squeamish, you need to look away and I'll only flash the, the, the thing, up, the, the picture up, but if you're not squeamish, then don't worry. Um, all right, so I'll, I'll just flash for three seconds. So this is the first picture that I found of Platfontaine. All right, one, two, three, it's gone. Okay, so when I found that picture, I looked at it and I read the little caption underneath and I knew that I had found my community in trouble. I knew that I had found something that I needed to talk about in my book. And then that was when I then went into the back, the back end of the research to go and look for why did the sand land up in Platfontaine and why have they landed up in a place where there's so much drugs and so much alcohol abuse and what happened to these beautiful people because when I think of the sand people I think of the gods must be crazy and these beautiful um these beautiful people running around in the bush I, I, I don't think of, of of like that type of horrific you know things happening um, so I went into a little bit into the back back end of what happened and and it was actually the people from the 31st Battalion who were at the Niga base who were fighting with the South Africans who then when the whole South African border war ended with Namibia they had been fighting with South Africans and then the, the Namibians you know that they, they now knew that they were you know they'd been fighting with the enemy basically so um, the South African government took 4,000 of them and said, okay, that's okay, you know, we'll, we'll house you in South Africa, we'll, we'll give you all this thing. And in the end, it took them 20 years. And out of those 4,000 people, only 1,000 of them were eventually settled in Platfontaine. So what happened to the other 3,000 people? You know, and this was one of the things which I found in my research, which was really quite disturbing because, you know, it was the soldiers and the women and the children, and they all moved from Amiga base, and then they went to Mangeli Dunes, and then they were moved to um, Swakop's Drift, and then they were in tents for nearly 20 years before they were moved to Platfontaine. But Platfontaine is not exactly a beautiful place either. Platfontaine is just these little Lego buildings all over the place, and I will show you it. So one of the things that really disturbed me was that they had gone from being people like this who could actually, you know, support themselves in the environment that they were in. And um, Ferdinand Jr., uh, Via Jr., um, these are actually his pictures, and I, I just wanted to thank him for his side of the research as well. He is an, an 
I'm probably going to get this word wrong. He's an anthropologist. So he actually lives with them and, and he studies them and he helps them and, and he documents everything. He's, he's one of those. So he actually lives with them in the middle of the Kalahari at the moment. And um, so these are some of his beautiful pictures of, and, and it was sort of like, how did they go from this, um, being able to support themselves in such a hostile environment to suddenly living in little Lego houses like this. And this is a house in Platfontaine. And you can see on the back of that second house over there that, you know, that's a toilet stack, you know, and that's basically, they don't even have running water in most of these houses. And it's just, it's just atrocious. And it's just, it's just another sad story of a people who have been persecuted and, and basically lost, lost themselves. Um, not, not their fault, not, you know, it's just what's happened. And it's, it's really, really sad. So I knew that I had to tell their story and I'm going the wrong way again. All right. So those are my elements of fiction that I could bring in. I mean, of, of, of truth that I could bring in. And then of course I bring in my elements of fiction because I don't always tell a true story. I always tell a story with lots of fiction in it as well. And so my conspiracy theory plot line, um, that was basically I was I started sort of doing research and trying to trying to see how pills were manufactured and I couldn't get into a company in Australia that would actually show me how to manufacture pills. It was quite incredible because it was almost like they had this telephone line between them because I phoned the one company in, 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 um, in Brisbane and I went, you know, I'm an author, I want to do that, this is what I want to do. And they went, oh no, sorry, we can't let you into the factory. And it was, I, fa I found, you know, the next manufacturer and the next manufacturer and I just seemed to be coming up against this brick wall of people just not wanting to talk about how you manufacture pills, which was quite interesting. And then I found this, um, which was from the, um, the World Health Organization about substandard and falsified medicines um, affecting the most vulnerable communities. And of course, I was about to write about a vulnerable community. So, um, and then this, this amazing statistic that one in 10 medical products in the developing countries is substandard. And I knew that I then had my conspiracy theory and I could then make my fictional part of the book. Now, obviously, medical people don't go out to poison, you know, their customers, but in my book, they do. So it was sort of like I had to, I had to find a way to sort of bring it all together. And, and um, yeah, the medical people were the ones because of these statistics. Um, so it was interesting because when I went to Facebook and I went to YouTube, there's a lot of information on YouTube. I could actually see how, you know, things were manufactured and, you know, the, the, the amazing equipment out there. And because I come from a manufacturing background, I got really lost in this sort of rabbit hole of, of it. And then um, the actual making of the pills and stuff like that. So it was really, really interesting. But I knew that, you know, I would put everybody to sleep if I put that all in a book. So um, I just sort of, you know, you gloss over that. And I think the most important thing on that is actually when I, I had spoken to our, our normal um, pharmacist down down the road at, at my chemist and I'd said oh you know I've been trying to get these people and trying to see what they make and he said to me Tini you don't need that all you need is a conspiracy between two or three people and you can break any system and I went oh you know that is so true as long as you have conspiracy between people in a company you can break no matter what auditing you know things they put in practice if you can circumnavigate those you can you can break a company and then you know it was sort of like all just flowed really well from there so it was interesting because a lot of readers, even though they'd met these protagonists before, they didn't realize it. I'm going the wrong way. Okay, so in Nature of the Lion, they actually met these two. Um, and Nature of the Lion was the book before. And um, so I often do that. I, I leave these little Easter eggs in some of my books and I know that they will come out later. And this, this was one of them. And I knew that this, in, in Nature of the Lion, that these two were going to come out later because I'd already started, I'd already started the second book, you know, before I did this. But that, that's a really small part. So this, to me, is what Lily looked like. And I thought that she was really, really lovely. And I never, ever went and found a, a younger picture of her. This, to me, is what, is what she was. Um, and this is Quentin, of course, you know, when he was younger and then when he was older. 
Um, and Quinton, to me, I, I just wanted to write this amazing, amazing male because, you know, I've got two men, you know, two, two boys, young men, whatever you want to call them. And, and I've got a really nice husband and I'm just so tired of the male bashing that was going on at that stage. And the whole, you know, males are all bad and the stigma that suddenly come out about males. And it's like, you know what, not all of them are bad. Some of them are really good. And, you know, and, and when I wrote Quinton, I actually wrote him because I wanted to show that, you know, behind every successful man, there's a successful woman, obviously, who pushes him. But behind every successful woman, there's also that man who's there standing by, you know, beside her and pushing her and helping, you know, and, they, and, they, and they're, they're a couple that they, they, they have to be together. So it was, um, so for me, writing these two was a very emotional journey. And it was, it was really, it was to me, they were really, you know, my sort of, I really loved them a lot. And I was, um, it was a really emotional book for me to actually write. I cried a lot in this book. It was, it was, it was very emotional. So the elements that I think made the magic in the book was the Stradivaria, um, because, but I haven't actually, I've obviously I've listened to lots, but I've actually still not seen a Stradivaria in real life, but I got to find these, um, these glass violins. Now the glass violins are actually manufactured by Hario, which is a Japanese company. And they were so different to deal with than the drug companies, because at first I was actually going to smash one of these because it's glass. I went, Oh, I can smash it, you know, make a nice mess. And then they were so helpful and they just, you know, I just reached out to them and they gave me all the most amazing, you know, like stats about the violins. They gave me all these videos and everything. They were so helpful. And I just went, oh no, I can't, I can't do this. I can't smash it. So I, I then changed what I was going to do with it because they had been so helpful and the drug companies hadn't. So, yep, the drug companies got the bad and these ones got the good. <laughs> so, so yeah, so they were, and, and, you know, and I sent the, the, the gentleman a book to say thank you. And, um, but yes, I thought those were just stunning. Um, so the, obviously one of the things that happen in this book is, is the early onset old timers. And um, I, I really battled with this part because when I was started writing this, the diagnosis came through for my own mother that this is what they thought she had. And um, it was really, really difficult because I had already started all the research and I was redoing the book when when this news came in and it was it, it was kind of it really really threw me a lot to have to then write all this knowing that this is what was going to happen to my mother and um in in the end my mother was then re-diagnosed with um vascular dementia which is you know it, it's it's along the same lines but it's um so yeah, so a lot of the book was was really hard to do. So, and as I was writing it, like I was going through the whole symptoms, and 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 the symptoms are actually like like little little drip fed through the book. You know that like the memory loss and the and the planning and solving problems where that goes wrong, and you know the, the familiar tasks and determining time and place. Um, you know, finding the right words. Now that's something I often have a problem with, and I then went. <gasps> Oh no, I've got dementia, you know, I've got I've got Alzheimer's, I've got Alzheimer's. And I started having all these um, you know, problems. And it was like, and I, I remember speaking now, Amy Andrews, which I've already spoken about, she's actually also a nurse. And I I remember phoning her and saying to her, Oh no, I'm telling you, I'm writing this book on the your because of course at that stage, you know, when things aren't going right, it's always somebody else's. So it's you know your book on flamingos, Amy. So it's um so it was it was quite funny. And I said to her, I'm having all these symptoms, and she said, No, what you're doing is you're just procrastinating and not finishing the book. Just put your bum in that chair and finish it. And it was probably one of the best, you know, pieces of advice that I could have ever got from a writing friend because she just basically just wrote off all my fears and said, Yeah, get over it right so it was it was it was really good um i got to play with the benefits of cbd oil in this book now i used to I, obviously i was brought up in a really um in, in, a, in a household where there was no gambling no you know your drinking was very minimal you were allowed um um brandy and the christmas pudding and, and you know there wasn't much drinking and stuff like that and um so for me to then take something like um you know weed which is um like, like which we call dacha which you call marijuana um 
to to me that was always a really bad thing you know and 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 then to actually know that it was actually doing good and that there's medical marijuana out there that actually does good and so i got to play with that whole sort of the, the, the beliefs and the benefits of of the you know alternative medicine in this case and we we got some for my mum and we gave it to her but you know in, in in australia there's a lot of standards that actually get used for it but in south africa there's not so she happened to get some with a, a quite a bit of thc which is the stuff that makes you kind of goofy <laughs> and my mother and my aunt who had cancer at that time um had it and yeah they were both totally stoned for a while <laughs> so yeah so um but the next bottle that they got was was better and you know there was less of that and so yes it was um but i did I, you know so i can say yes i tried that on my mom but it's you know it's one of those things <laughs> now one of the surprises in this book is um probably if you if you know your birds this is actually a firebird um, this is a, what they call a fire finch, and this is what I knew as a firebird. So when my editor actually wanted to change the name of the book and she wanted one of the things that came up was Cry of a Firebird, um, I said to her, but this is a little, this is what a firebird is. And she said, well, just make the story work, you the author. And it was one of, the, and she, when she said that, it was like her, her belief in me that I could take something like that and make it into the into the flamingo. And it sort of like helped the story along and, and the whole, the whole, um, sand story then came out about you know with the whole traditional story of of, of becoming a, a firebird and becoming you know like because they do they look like they're on fire when you look at them a flamingo on, on the actual water so i just wanted to show everybody what the original firebird actually was so um and that was sort of like when i wrote it i sort of i, I finished the book and i was an emotional mess and it was like i i I, I loved writing that book. Um, I cry in two scenes every single time. Now, the Queensland Writers um, Organization asked me to do a reading of the first chapter of the book. And Sean and I did the filming of it. And I we must have filmed it about seven times. And every time I get to the beginning, like the end of the, of the prologue sort of part, I crack up and my voice cracks up and I just start crying. And it's a bit hard because now we've had to sort of piece the pieces together and, and um, because I'm, I'm still very emotional about this book. And I think I always will be because it was a really, because it's, you know, the themes in the book were so close to me and it, it wasn't that I set out to write a close to me, it happened along the writing process. So, um, so this book's really special to me in, in the way that, you know, it is very close to my life as well, you know, to, to my mum with what's going on. So um, in case you want to know what else TM Clark is or who else I actually am, I do run Writers at Sea, which I don't know if it's going to run this year because we are now, you know, everybody with COVID and, and everything, but basically we go on a week's retreat with everybody at sea and we go to, um, we go out and we do the islands and it's, it's really, really lovely and, and I mentor people and, and help them with their own books. Obviously, I run, I run the CYA conference, but I also do a lot of um, books for Africa and PNG and we build libraries. Um, I just did a drive now where a school had burnt down in Papua New Guinea and we've just, um, we're sending a whole lot of um, the kitchen equipment and dining room tables and, and stuff like that because I put out a, a, a call for that, which I was really, really thankful to everybody to, for answering that call. So that's been running for about nine years now and um, building the libraries in Papua New Guinea with the secondhand books. Um, you can see some of the libraries. Um, those empty shelves were actually full when this library opened. That means that the kids have those books out, which is, is, is always really, really good. So um, this is actually teaching in, in Papua New Guinea. I go there once a year and I teach for book week at the international school at um, Higaturu. Um, this is Claire Saxby. Um, many of you might know her. She, she writes most amazing picture books and she just had her first novel out. Um, so she, she's one of the authors who go with me. We've also had um, Phil Kettle with us and Judy Horacek was also, she also comes with us. Um, so this is Claire and then this is me. I, I normally get the older kids because I obviously I've got more novel behind me. So um, you can see my fat foot in the picture there. And um, yeah, so that's me working with, now this is part of the outreach. So that's not the school that we actually go to. That's the, the children in like the other schools who have come in to come and see us that we work with. So we do like an outreach program in the afternoons. 
Um, we also started a, um, this is one guy in the middle. So, uh, and we started a women's empowerment project um, there because um, the ladies who clean all the, all the executive houses, they don't have any other skills. So we went, well, if they can sew, then they can make a living. So we um, sent over five machines and it was Von Gaia's idea. And then um, we found when we got there, Von Gaia actually didn't know how to sew herself. So she was going to lead this project. And um, so in a week, we t um, Claire and I are both sewers. So we, we taught her how to sew quickly in a week. And then she's got like YouTube and stuff that she can use. But amazing. And then um, when she opened the project up, um, two of the ladies came and they said, oh, they had actually been sewing in um, sewing companies. So they could actually also help her. So it's amazing how much it actually helps. And most of the time they make um, reusable sanitary pad um, with the machines and they make me making little bags and things but eventually they'll be able to make you know whatever but um so the, we're always shipping stuff for that as well um and then my recent holiday snaps which um was a lot of research for my new book that i'm doing which i just finished and sent sent in so so this obviously this these are just normal wildebeest um and in then the little ground squirrel, I always think that they, they're so beautiful. I, I just love little ground squirrels. I think this is actually, uh, yes, it is. Um, when, I, when I came across these, I just, it was, they're one of the animals that just make me smile. Maybe because I've got a scar on my chin from where a squirrel bit me as a child, but, you know, <laughs> I just love them. <laughs> Then I met this little this little um, guy, and he was just so sweet. If you just listen to his little call. He's just beautiful. And he was in one of the, um, like the cat sanctuaries there. And his, his father was um, a spotted and then his mother was just totally black. And um, it's so, so she was absolutely stunning. But you can see that, you know, and that's how close you can get because obviously, it, you know, it's South Africa. I did uh, an amazing, amazing elephant experience. And one of the funny things was um, this elephant wouldn't let me go. She kept wrapping her trunk around me and pulling me back to her. And the gentleman said to me, this is very strange that she's doing this. And I had to admit to him, no, don't worry. I'm, my uncle had three elephants and you know, I'm quite used to elephants. It's not a problem. And he said, oh, it was like the elephant knew that I wasn't scared and she just kept holding me to her sort of thing. So it was, it was very, very lovely to meet them and to, you know, to get their story. And you can actually see, I mean, I'm five foot seven. So you can see, you know, they're, they're not exactly small animals. So, but, you know, it was, it was an amazing, amazing time. And then this is when I'm going to get a kiss from one on my face. Um, and they, it's, it's a taught behavior, so they, they try and they don't do it, but they went, oh, no, they, they were going to give me a kiss. And I then had all the slobber. So if you have a look here. Um, <laughs> another one, another one, last one, last one. And then she... Last um, one, last one, get the last one, get the last one. <laughs> you can see my face, it's all full of snot. And just the ground that, that you know, because it's picking up the peanuts on the floor and then... <laughs> So, so I got this the most amazing kiss from an elephant, and and when I, when I had it, I thought that would that would just be the most beautiful name for my you know for my follow on from Child of Africa will probably be kiss from an elephant or something like that. So, it's just um it was it was a stunning stunning time. So um, what's next? Um, so lot lot I used to call it lot four hundred two, but it got changed to lot twelve. So lot twelve will probably have a name change. But it is actually done. It's it's done. It's it's gone. It's going through edits. Um, this is research done in South Africa. This is where you come to um, roadworks, and the South Africans just have absolutely no care for rules. So the little white car is actually not supposed to be there. The road has been closed on the other side, and he just came comes through anyway. And then every time there's a car, he just whips around the side and then comes back. So they've got absolutely no regard for rules. And it was one of the things which I had forgotten about, which, you know, not having traveled there for a while, is that they blatant disregard for the law. Um, and I think I've become a very, very good Australian because, you know, it was like, oh, they're not obeying the laws. So um, I was lucky. I was very, very lucky. I went to Tambani um, Wildlife and I did a whole lot of research. So this is their sable. Um, and they actually do um, a lot of 
um, exotic game. So, and this is a golden wildebeest, and this is sort of what Lot 12 comes to be about now. So it's coming up about the golden wildebeest. And then I've never seen a golden wildebeest, and I had never seen a black impala. So for me to actually go there was just amazing to actually see these animals, which are just color variants, which have come up and, and, are, and are now being used. And that it's not that they're freaks of nature, they have occurred in the wild, but in the wild, obviously they were hunted first or, and, you know, and taken out, but now they've been, the gene has been you know, preserved and, and the colors are brought back. So um, the black the black impala is just is just beautiful the midnight impala. So um, basically, wherever you go and create experiences to last a lifetime, I think COVID has helped us all to sort of remind us about that definitely. And in Africa, remember that dung beetles have right of way because not only do they, you know, clear the way of all the shit, but it actually does fertilize everything as well. So they they do have their job. And because I grew up in Zimbabwe, I want to say siabonga, which means thank you, and hambakala, which means go well. And then that's my social page, if you're interested in any of my social media. And yeah, right, back to the library and questions, if I need any questions. Now I just have to find, I go escape here, and then I should stop. Now, how do I stop, stop sharing? Ta-da! Yeah, I'm back to you. <laughs> I'm gonna say I don't know how to stop sharing. So no to help. <laughs> if you do have any questions um, for Tina, please pop them in the group chat. Um, for the meantime, can you give us an insight into your writing technique? So, are you someone? I mean, you did say ten years for your first novel, but are you someone who sits down and gets it done, or you know, do you have a plan? Are you a pantser? How do you write? You know, I think every single book is different. I would love to say that I plan. I think I do plan. I, in fact, I know I plan, but they don't always go according to plan. Um, my first three books were probably written pants when, were not planned. But then after that, I was losing like between 30 and 40,000 words per book. And I realized that it was really hard to keep to the, 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 the schedule that the publisher was you know, setting if I, if I didn't have more of a plan and didn't actually have sort of more, no more. So I started this whole character development before I do it, because for me, my characters drive my stories. So um, I do a lot of character development before I even start my story. And I have a sort of a plan as to where the story is going. I normally know the ending, the ending might change, but I normally do know my ending. Um, and then, so I know what I'm writing to. Um, I, I, I have been known to go in and write my ending and then write to my ending, because to me, that just makes sense. Um, but I do, I do mostly write in chronological order. And I, even though afterwards, I can often switch chapters around and stuff like that and the edit. Um, I actually write on, I, I do my little planning on stickies and I put them physically on my cupboard. Now my husband came up with this beautiful program and he put them all into this program and color codes them. But I actually found that I'm still better to do it manually and then he can do that. And with color coding, it actually helps with seeing where my tension is and if it's lifting in the right place or not. Um, and if I'm sort of like bringing more tension towards the end with my red, because obviously I use red for tension. Um, but my original stuff is still done manually on my cupboard. So. <laughs> right, that makes me feel really good about my own writing. <laughs> I'm a bit the same. It's just postments everywhere, pieces of paper everywhere. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a process. And, you know, and, and each, book, each book is different. Like the book I just wrote was totally different to, the, to, the, you know, to when I wrote Flamingos. Absolutely, totally different. We're in flamingos. I cried the whole way through. This one, I was so angry the whole time. I just, you know, because of what was happening, I just wanted to, you know, shoot the person kind of thing. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> I was just angry the whole way through the book. So it's, um, you know, depending on what's going on, it's, it's, it's also, you know, whether I pants more. This book, I definitely pants a lot more, even though I knew my ending already. Um, whereas in Flamingos, it was more planned. Um, it's, it's just, it, it depends on the book. But I do have to plan it a little bit, quite a lot, I would say. Otherwise, I just waste words. Fair enough. And Catch has just asked, um, what's next after the next book is published? 
So after the next book, I am writing a follow on from Child of Africa. So, <laughs> so though um, Njlovi, which is the elephant in um, Child of Africa, she hasn't kept quiet. And Joss and Peter's story is still is still carrying on talking in my head. So they they will be the next one after the after lot twelve is, is done. Then um, that's the plan is to is to write that. Yeah, because I, I I do you know she's she's still talking and and she really really loved um, her place in that book and I think she wants to carry on. She wants to take you further into Africa and show you more. Oh, amazing. Now, Rosemary has just asked, where do you get your inspiration from? So I think we're talking more characters and plot line. It's pretty obvious where you get the general um, inspiration okay. from. Um, so characters, um, some characters walk on my page literally without having any planning. So in Child of, uh, in, um, in Firebird, when Pete walked onto my page, he was, um, I already had a policeman planned and um, I was going to use another policeman in the story. And then Pete walked onto my page and when he walked on, he was in Bushman, his traditional Bushman clothes with Nike tackies on and oh, trainers, sorry, wrong, wrong word, but with trainers on. And, um, and he just walked onto my page and started started being part of the story and and i realized he wanted to be in the book and he wanted that policeman part was totally his and it what did not belong to the other guy so for me sometimes they do that most of the time i know i need a protagonist and i actually do plan out the um i plan out the villain part of my book as well because i try because i'm from south africa and we've got this whole rainbow nation i try not make one race per you know like so if you look through the books there's a different race per book that is actually the villain i try not do too many of the same race being the villains because it's very important to know that badness is in all of us no matter what your color and goodness is in all of us no matter what the color and i normally have um i normally have two at least two main protagonists and 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 then I have obviously my villains, so those I I normally actually plan those out quite carefully, and um, I look a lot at pictures, so um, I spend a lot of time trawling through like model sites and finding nice looking people, um, and then I go oh that one and that one, or if I see like I found Quinton. Um, so the, the older Quinton is on a model site, but the younger Quinton is actually a person just, you know, out of a news clipping. So I do look at those as well. Um, I, I, I do, I'm a very visual person. So it's really weird that I never, ever have a picture of my villain. I just, the whole way through. So from my first one, who was Rodney, who was an albino, I never, I never wanted to actually put a face on my villain and show my readers a villain and go this is my villain because um then you know that person is sort of like would, would be bad and sort of thing so I'm, i've never so I, when i had buffle in you know in tears of the cheetah no buffle came from shooting butterflies i just had a buffalo and that's it on, on my screen and and that's him so i never actually have a picture of my villain um um he can be as horrible as he likes and I never actually, I, I, I sort of like know what he looks like. Like I've got in, in lot 12 coming, that there's a lot of tattoos that are very prevalent to the story. And I've got pictures of his tattoos and stuff like that, but I don't actually have a picture of his face. So yeah, yeah. that's really interesting. And I suppose it's almost like, yeah, evil being a presence, not necessarily a person as well. Like it's, yes. yeah. Absolutely. Um, some of my, like I often take an evil person and I will base a lot on that. So, um, so for some of my characters, I, I will take like a, a, a criminal that I've read up about and go, oh my goodness, you know, that wasn't very good of them. And I will use elements of that in my, in my, in my basing of my villain. Um, the controversy, going to be very, very controversial. Um, in lot 12, that's coming. I had listened to a podcast about is Mother Teresa a saint or is Mother Teresa a demon? 
and I had listened, I think it was a What the Fish or something like that podcast. And it was basically, you know, with what she did, you know, she would rescue these babies, but then she wouldn't actually give the woman any contraception to stop the babies happening. And it was this whole debate was, is she good or is she bad? And I brought in a nun just like that to be able to go, she's doing this for a reason. Is she good or is she bad? So I, I, I do draw inspiration from, from real life people and, and, um, and base a little bit of stuff on them. But obviously a lot of it's just, you know, the rubbish that comes out of an author's head from all the, from all the voices in there. <laughs> well, thank you for that insight into what 12. That's intriguing. I must say, <laughs> intriguing. Now, we have a comment from Lynn. She said, a terrific, well-planned, informative talk. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Lynn. That's lovely. Now, we, poss we possibly have time for one more question if somebody does have one. Rosemary said, uh, great, very interesting. Well, thank um, you. I might ask my final question then, um, and then we will have to wrap it up. Who are you reading at the moment? Who are your go-to authors? <laughs> All right. So I always read, when I'm finished my book, I always read a Tony Park book. I, I try not read his books when I'm writing because I was a big fan of his before I started writing. And I'm, and, and I'm lucky now to call him a friend. So I have his books stacked up there. And then when I'm not writing, the first go-to book of mine is always one of his books. Um, because then I get to sort of like just enjoy the African experience without having to, to write it myself. Um, other than that, um, I have got a pile of books next to my bed. <laughs> but yeah, at the moment, I actually have the, the last year's Tony Park, which I have just opened because I've just finished mine. So it's, um, yeah, which is, is, is really awesome. I don't know. I just find I, I can't write, I can't read his writing while I'm writing because I don't want to steal his voice. And I'm one of those people who even when I'm listening to African music, uh, I find I'm putting those lyrics in my in my book. So I'm lucky my husband is my first reader, so he recognises the lyrics and he takes them out. So where I've learned that when I'm writing, I, I sort of like have like instrumental music if I can, um, rather than having music because I tend to absorb other people's things and put them in. So yeah, so I'm very very careful with that. But that's that, that's my go-to when I when I'm finished. <laughs> Fabulous. I always find it so fascinating who other, how the writers are reading. So thank you very much for sharing. The other books are probably all romance. I have to admit, I still love my romance. I will still read in my bath. I will still get a Mills and Boone, like Amy Andrews or Ali Blake, you know, Robin, uh, Robbie Grady, whichever. You know, Dakota's here. Dakota Harrison's got beautiful books. Although I can't read hers in the bath because hers are digital. So <laughs> <laughs> Could get a bit dangerous. <laughs> it could be a bit, bit dangerous, yeah. <laughs> But I do, I still read in the bath. Um, if I'm going to read in the bath, it's a Mills and Boone. Absolutely. That sounds good to me, perhaps with a wine, I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and thank you so much, Tina, for joining us today. Um, Tina's books are available to reserve at Frankston City Libraries. Um, and you can collect them now from Frankston, Caram Downs or Seaford Libraries. Or we've also got them on our um, e-book digital platforms. Um, you can also purchase Cry of the Firebird through Robertson's Bookshop in Frankston and we will pop a link directly to Tina's books um, with Robertson's when we share this on social media in probably about an hour. So <laughs> keep an eye on Frankston City Library's website. We've got some great authors and personalities coming up. But thank you so much for joining us today, Tina. We've absolutely, I absolutely loved your presentation. Uh, it's been wonderful to have you. Thank you very much for having me. And thank you for coming out and joining me, everybody. It was really, really lovely. 